The PIS really carries two special things for me. Uh, one is the very strong sense of community here. Uh, it's a very trusted platform that you feel free in sharing your thoughts, sharing your ideas, how you see the global markets and the world, together with your fellow central bank governors. I joined on day one, uh, on the 1st of April 1993, when the HMA was established. Uh, and since then, we went through a lot. But all through, the financial system of Hong Kong has remained really steady and resilient. I'm Eddie Yu, I'm the Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. And I'm Tao Zhang, Chief Representatives for the BIS Asian Office, speaking from Bado, but our office based in Hong Kong. You're listening to Business, the podcast from the Bank for International Settlement. So Eddie, welcome to BIS podcast. You are the first governor from Asia to join the podcast. So a very warm welcome. You are particularly welcomed here on the occasion of the 30 years anniversary of Hong Kong Monetary Authorities and the 25th anniversary of the BIS uh, ResRap office in Asia, based in Hong Kong. Today, we and our audience have a great deal of interest in hearing your views on a number of the issues, including, for example, the evolutions of Hong Kong Monetary Authorities, Asia, and the emerging market, digital innovation, and also your own experience in working with BIS. So today, we're very pleased and honored to have you with us. Thank you. So before I raise the first questions. Let me congratulate you once again on the 30th birthday of the uh, Hong Kong Monetary Authorities. You joined the Hong Kong Monetary Authority the same year when it was born in 1993. How has the Hong Kong MA evolved in the past 30 years? Well, Tao, it's been a very long journey. Uh, as you said, I joined on day one uh, on the 1st of April 1993 when the HMA was established. Uh, and since then, we went through a lot. Uh, first, the handover of the sovereignty, and then we've got the Asian financial crisis, uh, and SARS in 2003, global financial crisis, and the last few years, another pandemic, plus the social unrest in Hong Kong. So there's a lot that's been happening, uh, but all through, the financial system of Hong Kong has remained really steady and resilient. Uh, and the exchange rate system has been very stable. Uh, so we've been uh, you know, coming through each crisis, uh, each challenge. We came out well and we actually came out stronger. Uh, and after these 30 years, there are two things that I can uh, share on uh, how we grow and how we uh, maintain our resilience. Uh, one is really to be pre prepared, uh, both in terms of building up buffers, in terms of the FX reserve. In 1993, we got 38 billion US dollars, and now we've got 420 billion US dollars. It's a very, very big buffer that you use to create confidence in the market, the, and buffers in the banking system as well. Uh, high capital adequacy ratio, high liquidity ratio, etc. cetera. Uh, prepare contingency plans that you can just take out for use, like in global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. What we did was we just took out a folder, and that's what, that was our liquidity plan. And we don't really have to have another 10-hour meeting to come up, to, to come up with it. Uh, and uh, that's one thing. The second thing that I learned is really to be agile because every crisis comes in different forms and shapes. There are some common elements, but each time is different. Like three years ago, when we were confronted with the uh, social unrest, there were rumors going around, but it was really through the social media. It was digital speed. So the traditional way of using press release, uh, having spokesmen is seriously outdated. What we did was to use a lot of social media to do it in digital speed as well. Once a rumor came out, we have a you know, posts on Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram in two or three hours. So uh, uh, it's really the preparedness and the agility that got us to come through uh, all these crises. And as I said, we've learned a lot through the years. Great. Looks like a lot of the achievement in the 
short 30 years. Now, as mentioned earlier, Eddie, um, the BIS is celebrating the 25th anniversary of the BIS Asian office in Hong Kong this year. And thank you and uh, the Hong Kong MA for being such a gracious host to our Asian office over the past 25 years. As you know, uh, even before a BIS Asian office was established, uh, the Hong Kong MA joined the BIS as a member in 1996. So how has your overall experience been working with the BIS? Uh, first, of course, as a staffer, and now as a chief executive of Hong Kong Monetary Authorities. Well, it's been great experience. Uh, first of all, uh, we'd also like to thank the BIS for choosing Hong Kong to be the place uh, for your Asian hub. In fact, when the Asian office was uh, first established, I was there uh, at the inauguration ceremony, uh, and we and we are stationed in the same same building, so we saw see see each other a lot, uh, and. Uh, in fact, I started coming into uh, Basel, I think since 98, 99. Uh, and since then, I counted uh, this morning. I came here for almost 100 times already. And I always like this, this place. The BIS really carries two special things for me. Uh, one is the very strong sense of community here. Uh, it's a very trusted platform that you feel free in sharing your thoughts, sharing your ideas, how you see the global markets and the world, together with your fellow central bank governors. Uh, and it's also a very intellectually powerful platform in that uh, you learn from others. You hear what they say about the world. In this very interconnected and highly complex world that we are now in, uh, this is very, very valuable. But it's not really just the formal meetings. I also value a lot the side meetings. I really think it's useful for the more informal dialogue that we have, whether it's meetings or over the phone, uh, especially when you see cracks somewhere in the system, just to get another, another, another thought. The other thing that I always feel special about coming to Basel is that I always leave the place learning something, both from the meetings, uh, from the discussions, and also from the very high quality papers uh, that the staff team has pulled up. Uh, all the background notes, all the analysis, some of the presentations are just fabulous. Uh, and I always go, go away learning a lot. Uh, and these are the two things that I, uh, I, I really like uh, coming to Basel and belonging, feel belong to this community. Uh, of course, for the BIS uh, Asian office, uh, there's, there are a lot different layers of collaboration, ranging from research, uh, from innovation, uh, from the other areas. And Right here, I would like to make a small advertisement. Uh, we are going to jointly host the BIS and HKMA high-level conference on the 28th of November, where we get a lot of current and former central bank governors to talk about the affairs of the world uh, with a bit of looking back in order to look forward. Uh, and I encourage all listeners, uh, all the audience here, uh, to tune in. Fantastic. You mentioned that the, the BIS as a uh, community and of course, the uh, in Asia, we have the Asian office, which is small uh, communities. And certainly, uh, we have uh, achieved a lot in the past 25 years uh, in Asia, particularly uh, for the BIS Asian office there. And uh, particularly uh, important in recent years, uh, under the uh, guidance of the BIS Asian Consultative Councils, of which you were the members. So um, going forward, uh, how do you think uh, the BIS could continue to serve our Asian shareholders and constituencies better and better? Well, I, I think the support that the Asian office has been giving to the Asian economy through the ACC uh, has already been, been very outstanding. Uh, going forward, I think there are two areas that uh, we can collectively do more. Uh, one is to further deepen the analytical framework that we have collectively developed uh, for Asian policymakers in the form of the macro financial stability framework, which actually um, puts together all the tools that we have in the toolbox. Uh, think about how we can use it in a more integrated, organized manner to in order to 
address the different challenges uh, that we're having in the region and what combination of tools we should use to make it uh, more effective or to optimize the effectiveness. Uh, so there could be more quantitative or intellectual work that we can do in these areas uh, that will facilitate our execution of those frameworks. Uh, the other area that's been uh, done quite well, uh, especially in the last few years, uh, is the banking services that are given to the um, to the uh, Asian economies. Uh, and for two purposes, one is, of course, uh, for diversification and also for um, investment purposes. Uh, it's especially uh, convenient for Asian economies, for example, to diversify into uh, using the uh, BIS products offered by the banking department. And I'm also very glad that the banking department has also pulled out the Asian Green Bond Fund, which facilitates the Asian economies to recycle Asian capital to help the climate transition in Asia. Oh, thank you. It seems like we have a lot of work to do, particularly for the BIS Asian office. But the... Um uh, Eddie, let's stay with Asia a bit more. The region has grown substantially uh, in the past decades and is now the largest block uh, in the global economy. So if, y- if you uh, were to uh, taking out your crystal ball and uh, look into the future, what do you see are the main trends and developments we should be on the lookout or um, guard against uh, in the regions down the road? Well, I, of course, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, but there are three things that I would uh, think about uh, when thinking about Asian growth in, in the next few years. Uh, one is that uh, Asia will continue to be the engine of growth for the global economy, uh, especially not just in uh, China or India, but also from ASEAN, which is growing very fast. Uh, and I, I think we will continue to play that role and uh, is important as well. Uh, the second thing is Asia will be important in the climate transition. Uh, we are a problem because if you look at the current greenhouse emissions, more than half of that actually came from Asia. But we also will be a solution because of two things. One is I think different economies uh, are already having a lot of efforts uh, to transition into a greener society. A lot of financing have been put into that, and Hong Kong has been looking into that uh, as well. We can be the hub to support that transition by you know, using our financial markets, by coming up with very innovative products like blended finance. Uh, we can be a solution also because the new technology in solving the climate uh, problem partly also lies in Asia in terms of, for example, the electric vehicle, the new energy that we're seeing in solar, in hydrogen, they're, mo- they're actually mostly uh, very popular in Asia and many of the new inventions uh, come from here. Uh, so we, we could be a solution. The third thing is innovation. Uh, you know, In fact, the first two centers of the BIS Innovation Hub are in Asia, Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, And uh, in future, I think innovation, digital innovation, will continue to be a theme in Asia, not just about using the most state-of-the-art technology to drive banking business, but also about inclusion. If you look at China and India, the way that they modernize their payment system means that a lot more ordinary people can have access to basic payments and also bank accounts. Uh, And for the better use of data, we can also really expand financial inclusion to SMEs uh, in terms of getting loans easier and cheaper by riding on the data infrastructure that we're building across Asia. So I think um, growth, uh, climate transition, and innovation are the three three things that I'll look at. Asia hosted uh, quite a few number of the uh, emerging market economies. Um, So beyond Asia, if you look at the uh, emerging market economy as a whole, um, so um, uh, the question is uh, how uh, you would see uh, the uh, these economies, uh, you know, the uh, the outlook. But before we uh, get to the questions, let me uh, congratulate you first on your recent uh, appointment as the chair of the BIS Emerging Market Economy Meetings. And you are the first uh, central bank governor to assume uh, this role. So congratulations. In your view, 
What are some of the most daunting challenges facing emerging market economies in the increasingly complex and uncertain world we are facing today? What can they do better coping with these challenges? Well, first of all, I feel really honored to be uh, asked to chair the emerging market economies uh, governance meeting. Uh, I've been in this meeting for quite a few years. And I always find it a very good forum for emerging market economies to exchange views about common challenges. As you said, going forward, uh, it's not a very easy world that we're facing. Uh, I, I think there are, two, again, two things that I will look at. One is uh, the macroeconomic uncertainties surrounding us. Uh, it's not really just growth and inflation. It's also about the increasingly or, or, or slightly asynchronous interest rate cycle that emerging markets may have vis-a-vis uh, -vis the advanced economies uh, when there will, there, there's likely to be high for longer in the advanced economy, some of the emerging markets are already reducing rates. And this gives rise to questions about capital flows, which is actually very important for most emerging economies. Uh, it gives rise to capital outflow issues, which might have exert pressure on the exchange rate. Uh, so it's a, it's a basket of issues that we will have to deal with, including not just growth, inflation, exchange rate, but also that might actually lead to issues in financial stability, uh, indebtedness, uh, and whether the, the government and the corporates are able to repay their debt. Uh, so um, I, I think in this environment, it's all the more essential that we get together and share uh, uh, our experience on these challenges. Uh, and that's one. The second thing is really the various disruptions that we're seeing around the world. Uh, I talk about climate, I talk about digital innovation. Uh, these are all applicable to the emerging markets in thinking about how to deal with these disruptions, but not just challenges, as I said. In, in, in the case of digital innovation, for places like you know, Brazil, which has PIX, uh, for um, Africa, which has m -Pesa. These are actually opportunities that they can leave from some of the uh, uh, payment uh, legacies uh, to really give the best services to people. Uh, so what I think they need to do is, uh, or we collectively need to do is, one, be resilient, uh, be, keep the house in order, make sure that whatever that comes to you, you have the ability to, to uh, face these challenges. Second, embrace changes, whether it's climate or innovation, uh, to find the opportunities from it. And third, deepen collaboration. Uh, it's a very interconnected world. Uh, for some of these global challenges, we need to work together to find solutions, to find opportunities. And this is exactly why uh, I think the Emerging Market Economies uh, Governance Meeting is an important forum for us to do that. And you have covered a number of the, uh, the areas and issues. And a moment ago, you touched upon climate change and also uh, digital innovations. I know this is uh, very much uh, at the front and center for you. So as you mentioned, Asia has been on the frontier of digital innovation in the past years. And under your leadership, uh, Hong Kong Monetary Authority is certainly one of the pioneers uh, in this endeavor. And of course, as you rightly, as you mentioned, uh, the Hong Kong MA has hosted one of the first uh, BIS innovation hub centers in Hong Kong. So looking back, what are some of the major uh, lessons learned um, or reflections uh, in the past few years in this space? And um, how do you see uh, in the future uh, the digital innovations uh, versus the, the central bank more generally and Hong Kong MA in particular. And in this regard, how can the BIS help? Well, we, we've been on this journey again uh, for quite a while, seven years already. Uh, and uh, we've learned a lot through that journey and I will you know, summarize them in, in two or three points. Uh, first is that uh, it's important to change your mindset in thinking about technology, central banks are born conservative. We are reservative. Uh, we only do things that where that there are very little risk. But if you carry that mindset into fintech, you won't you won't get anything that done. Uh, so 
it's got, there's got to be a degree of radical open-mindedness in accepting that whatever that you do, there's a good good probability that it might fail. And if, it, if you fail, fail fast and learn fast and move on. And that is actually something that we learn uh, through the process. And also, a lot of the projects that we do, you really need to look at the long-term uh, the, the, the long term commitment, it, you need to be persistent in investing into it, in really improving it. Uh, think about faster payment system. It's not an overnight success in Hong Kong, but it's now hugely popular. Why? Because we keep improving the product offerings through the faster payment system, including the recent linkage with PromPay. Um, so it's, it, that, that's one thing. The second thing that I learned is that uh, it is a very collaborative process. You collaborate through different sectors. You collaborate through uh, across borders as well. And this is actually where uh, the uh, BIS can offer a lot uh, in terms of cross-border collaboration in innovation, uh, in terms of projects like um, Nexus or Enbridge in Asia, which I think are great projects that will have a very good probability of success. Uh, In terms of uh, what will come in, uh, how we should think about innovation in the central bank context, I think there are several aspects. One is uh, in terms of regulation, whether it's done by banks, uh, other financial intermediaries, or whether it's dealing with crypto or stable coins, uh, we need to think about the right degree of regulation that can balance uh, safety for investors and innovation. The other part that, uh, the other thing that we need to think about is our own digitalization. The world has moved on. Uh, the, in the HMA, we invested heavily in the last few years and will continue to do, to do so in the next few years in our own digitalization across the board. And third is to create public good. And to me, um, cross-border payment, like I mentioned, will be one. How to make better use of data uh, will be second. In Hong Kong, we created a next generation uh, new data sharing infrastructure that will allow SME to get loans easier. And third is tokenization. It will be a good part of the future financial system and how to make the best use of tokenization while taking care of the risk is something that collaboratively uh, we can look more into. And I think it's really on the delivery of the public good that uh, the BISIH uh, Innovation Hub will have a lot uh, to uh, to do together with the central banks, including the HMA, uh, on that one. Great. We have come so far. Um, I don't think the, uh, we have a lot of time left. But before we close, let me ask you uh, uh, a final question uh, on the uh, personal front, Eddie. Um, you have been doing a lot of globe charting nowadays after Hong Kong reopened. How do you manage your downtime? Well, uh, downtime is important, so I always have it. I, uh, I treasure my evenings and my weekends a lot. Uh, and I, I like golf, uh, but my golf is getting worse. Uh, and I'm now gradually getting into table tennis because I was told that uh, playing table tennis can reduce the chance of dementia so that at least coming to Indo Basel, I can still remember all the names uh, for all the people that I'm meeting. So thank you, Eddie, once again. And thanks everyone for listening. Uh, you can read more about this topic and more on our website, uh, bis.org. Uh, please, if you uh, wish, do subscribe to Business on iTunes and the Spotify and follow the BIS on Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Instagram. See you next time.